In the city of Dredford, there was a small quaint store specialized in selling esoteric and strange articles to the public. The Noir Occult Shop, named after its owner, Amanda Noir. Dream catchers, healing crystals, tarot cards, herbs, oils, ritual tools, candles, incense and many other accessories for the mystically inclined were always in stock on its shelves. And best of all, it was open all night. Not far from it was the University of Dredford, and undergraduates wanting to fool around with the paranormal were a common source of customers. Also, within a short walk of the store was located the Dredford Cemetery, which helped the shop immensely with clientele. Once in a while, people who wished to perform all kinds of ceremonies near the burial grounds acquired their materials from it. One other service the store provided was private tarot readings and consultations from the owner herself. Amanda Noir built a fairly extensive list of customers who trusted her gift for foretelling the future. Will I get the promotion I want at my work? What does my financial future look like six months from now? Will Mr. Klein and I end up together? The heavy set lady asked in a barrage to the woman sitting across a small table from her. Ms. Russell, please, one question at a time. I want to know about Mr. Klein and myself, Amanda. The young woman artfully shuffled a deck and laid the tarot cards on the table in a Celtic cross spread. Do you love him? Of course. I have never loved someone this much. Have you ever loved someone? You look so young. One day you are going to know how it feels. I cannot imagine my life going forward without him. Amanda turned the first card face up, and Ms. Russell stopped talking and joined her hands anxiously. The young woman finished turning all the cards in her spread face up and studied them carefully. Both Mr. Klein and you are looking for companionship right now. However, for this relationship to work, you and him need to find abnegation within yourselves. Neither of you are ready to renounce anything, and this is going to make you clash a lot. But as you can see, prospects of improvement are positive. The card for your near future is the Two of Cups. A loud noise of glass shattering came from the storefront window. Both women got up and went to the main room of the occult shop. There were shards of glass all around the place. A stone was resting among ruined merchandise. Miss Russell went to the broken window to look outside and shouted insults. Amanda swiftly picked the stone. She saw that it had a paper attached to it, and a message was written on the paper in red letters. The ravens shall never be forgiven. Leave while you still can. Amanda put away the paper and the stone inside a drawer. I am sorry for that, Miss Russell. This neighborhood is becoming violent. Oh, you do not need to apologize. These delinquents are the ones who should. It is not just this neighborhood that is becoming violent. The whole city is going mad. This new generation is lost. I am going to clean up everything later. Do you want to finish your reading? Of course. But are you sure you are all right, dear? Such a young woman alone, you should have someone from your family nearby. I am sure it would make anyone think twice about doing this again. The young woman nodded in agreement, and both women returned to the small room they were in before. Ms. Russell, I am going to need you to close your eyes and concentrate on the question you want answered. A while later, Ms. Russell went out of the noir occult shop a little paler than usual, but with a lot of new ideas on how to get her prince charming. Far from there, on the other side of the city, inside a motel room, three Nosferatu were talking. So, this is where you retire during the day? Yeah, I'm in the room next to this one. And how do you protect yourselves from the sun? The bathrooms have no windows. Are you sure about this? I can help with better accommodations if you wish. There is no need, Oliver. Thank you. Since Julio is busy in the library and Eloise is spending a couple of nights with Nayati, I thought we could go over your case again. Maybe we can tackle it from new directions. Well, I have been pondering about it, and maybe I have an idea. You may not like it, but first, have you guys fed today? Not really, and Daniel has the rats, but it's not the same. Oliver opened a suitcase and handed a blood bag to each of his companions. Daniel took the bag in his hands. It contained human blood. He did not usually drink from humans. There was one time with Dupont and another when he was in dire need and asked Mary for a delivery, but he didn't like the fact that it was becoming a habit. He noticed Tom biting the bag and taking the blood inside, but Daniel hesitated. This blood had come from someone. How did they extract it? Who was the owner of this blood? Should he take it? 
Oliver, where did this blood come from? House Drakul has a huge blood reserve. I know they keep it frozen somewhere under the fang. I usually have a fresh supply of bags in the refrigerator inside my office. Daniel would never admit it, but he missed the taste of real blood. Tom was right, the one that came from animals was malnourishing and insipid to say the least. The thirst was never fully sated when he tried to fool it with the blood of rats. Come on, don't make me watch you bite a rat again. You look like the collector. Take it. This bag came from a donation. I checked before picking it. The detective felt relieved and allowed himself to bite the bag. He felt the sweet nectar filling his mouth. It was cold, and this provoked a protest from something deep inside him. Nonetheless, it was human blood. In a flash, he had consumed it all. He could only wonder what would have happened if this was someone, and he was biting a victim. Daniel, are you okay? I am alright, no need to worry. So Oliver, what was the idea you said we were not going to like? He asked, while giving the empty bags back to Oliver, who in turn put them both in an evidence bag and back into the suitcase for proper disposal. Our case to understand the incident involving Elsa is cold. We cannot find anything about the king. The man is a ghost. We have been unable to pinpoint the exact location where my grandsire supposedly was destroyed to investigate it. And, as you well know, all other avenues have been exhausted. Hasn't the leader of your house promised he would help with the matter of who sent the business card? Holloway's familiar says his own investigation is still going on. But, apart from him, no one in the King's Court is willing to help us. Truth be told, I feel like everyone in the court is actually making things harder for us to uncover whatever we are looking for. I don't know who to trust outside this crew. You sounded like you had come up with something. Oliver was in silence for a moment, as if he was building up courage to voice his idea out loud. Yes, we may have one way forward. House Morrigan. Michael told me House Morrigan has become extinct on Dreadford. Almost. Their progenitor was famous for being a powerful diviner, and from what I heard occasionally one of them manifests this ability. I know of one of them who is said to be able to do so. You want to ask a fortune teller about your case? This is absurd. I have heard about detectives using the services of psychics before. No talent hacks if you ask me. I have never believed in the supernatural. Relying on soothsaying to solve a case. Daniel, we are vampires. The world is a lot stranger than we imagined. We were under the city in front of a parliament of blood-sucking monsters just the other day. Why not give it a try? You can try talking with this fortune teller. I can't stop you, but I don't approve of these methods. You can't replace good detective work. Will you come along at least? Sure. How do we get a hold of him? I don't have his contact info, but my sire Nicholas does. I know he is a therapist and I plan to get an appointment with him. I just wanted to know if you guys were okay with the whole plan. Count us in. Tom patted Daniel in the back who had a scowl. A short while later, in Nicholas C. Graham's office in the Fang, Oliver was sitting with his sire. You want to go to counseling? Yes, Nick. You told me yourself I needed to take some days off. I believe professional help is exactly what I need. I have never heard of therapy being able to help us with our curse and the influence the dragon has over us. I don't think talking it out can do any harm, as long as you respect your NDAs. Okay, Oliver, I can get you an appointment with Dr. James Fields. How about tomorrow night? Great, I am going to be there. I am looking forward to getting this situation sorted out ASAP and coming back to work. I am glad to hear it, partner. Take your time and make sure everything is well. Nicholas answered with a smile, and Oliver got up and turned to leave. Oliver, one more thing. It has come to my attention that you are getting close to a child of account from House Strix. Father Michael. We are working on some side projects. He was putting a crew together, and I am helping them. Easy. I am not questioning you. I think it is a great idea for you to make friends and work together with other young Nosferatu. But be careful. House Strix is very dangerous. Dupont is not to be trusted. Yelena is a troublemaker, and Bloody Mary has ties with the revolution. Father Michael, the Midnight Fiend, you should beware of him. Do not let your guard down. And remember, birds of a feather flock together. Nick? Yes? Nah, it's nothing. You are a good friend. So are you, Oliver. The young Nosferatu left his sire's room. On the next night, Oliver was punctually admitted into Dr. James Field's office, 
while Daniel and Tom were in the waiting room. The office was extremely tidy and had numerous diplomas and degrees exposed on a wall. Some of them were several decades old. James was a middle-aged man with a big pair of glasses on his face. He had a very calm demeanor and a soothing voice. However, Oliver's senses were not fooled. Behind all that veneer of normalcy, Dr. James Fields was a vampire. Your sire told me you have been very anxious as of late. You have no need to fear anything while inside this office. Do you feel confident in telling me what ails you? Dr. Fields, I have been worried about an issue. I cannot get it out of my mind. Oliver explained thoroughly the issue with the card, his grandsire, and the results of the investigation the Midnight Fiends had achieved. The therapist heard it all in silence and took notes, always keeping a friendly and attentive demeanor. I am sure she is alive. The more I think about it, nothing else makes sense. I believe I heard her voice during the call. I can't fathom who else knows about it. Also, I cannot understand the card and bag. Who is sending them to me, and why? How does this problem make you feel? Tense. I cannot distract my mind from this whole situation. I cannot concentrate on my work. My sire feels I am going mad. What would it take for you to feel more at peace? Dr. Fields, I must be sincere with you. I wish to have your attention so I could ask for your help. Of course. We are going to find ways to help you here. No, Mr. Fields. Not your help as a doctor, but as a soothsayer. James Fields closed his notebook very disappointed. You scheduled this appointment only so you could exploit my curse of foresight? Please, Dr. Fields, do not take offense. I have tried to solve this case in every way. Me and my companions have no other alternative. I ask you this as a last resort. Offense taken, Mr. Oliver, if you please. He stood up and opened the door. It is a shame. I promised Nicholas I would aid you, but what you ask I cannot give you. But you can help me, Dr. Fields. If you would just listen to me and my associates... You don't know what you ask, Mr. Oliver. The Raven is a cruel, sadistic Nephilim. It tempts you with the promise of power only to curse you in return. It is a covenant that, if made, can destroy your eternity. I've seen in my family cousins cursed with bloodlust that cannot be measured. Others cursed with delight in ruining people's lives in degenerate ways. Some cursed with chronic bad luck and even blindness. Because the Raven always gets something in return. It is smart and cunning and vengeful. At least hear us, Dr. Fields. The doctor looked at the pleading young Nosferatu and saw genuine suffering in his eyes. He made a vow to help people. A vow he did not take lightly. Well... I guess it would not be a problem to hear you and your associates. Nice to meet you, Dr. Fields. My name is Daniel Reed. We apologize for the whole situation. I am Tom Bridges, sir. Call me James. I heard from Oliver you are helping him with his case, but you exhausted all leads. Daniel seemed upset but stayed in silence. Yes, James, it is very important to us. Unfortunately, if I try telling you the future, I am going to be more of a hindrance than help. Why do you say that? Nothing ever happens as I foresee. My visions of the future are bewildering, and what little shreds of information I can gather, when they are right, are about terrible misfortune and disasters. The three midnight fiends looked at each other. Oliver could not hide his dismay. So you are saying you can see the future, but it is hard to make sense of it? You could say that. Is there anything we can do to make you give it a try? James felt that Oliver would not rest easy until he got his answers. After a while, he sighed and stood up. The therapist took a large bottle from a cabinet nearby. He made a small cut at one finger and allowed three small blood drops to fall inside the bottle and mix with the liquid inside. If this will give you comfort, I'll try, but tone down your expectations. James said, before sitting again and pouring a glass for himself. What exactly do you want to know? Ask a precise question. Is Elsa alive? Who sent me the card and bag? What does the one responsible want? If we are already asking help from a fortune teller, we could ask about the king. Let's try to answer one question at a time. James drank the concoction and poured another one. He closed his eyes and picked it up, whirling the contents inside. As the red liquid swirled, he opened them again, and visions appeared to him in the vortex of the glass. The winds of destiny blow restless. I hear whispers. I see. 
I see a labyrinth, its walls twisting and turning, concealing peril. A thick fog makes it impossible to see beyond. A silhouette whispers about each of our journey's end as a reminder of the finite nature of existence. James opened his eyes again. He seemed baffled. I feel cold. It never felt like that before. It was not supposed to have ended so fast. Are you alright, Doctor? I am okay, but I'm sorry, Oliver. I don't know if anything I saw was of any help to your predicament. He pushed his fingers against his eyes for a moment, and when he opened them again, he put the glass of wine on top of his table. I know you must have heard that House Morrigan is made of great diviners. This reputation is mostly thanks to our progenitor here in Dreadford. Some have other abilities, some have none at all. It is not easy to explain it to Nosferatu of the other houses. The Raven, our Nephilim, is much more tame in trying to influence our behavior than others. Instead, it offers us powerful psychic capabilities, among which divination is only one. However, if we accept the deal of the Raven, the price is steep. He looked outside the window for a moment, watching the moon reach its zenith. Humans were not meant to have any of the gifts the Raven makes available to us. The more they develop, the more they cost us. Physical disabilities, mental disorders, loss of memory, and many other side effects are our curse. Each Morrigan that accepts these powers suffer from one or more of these curses, like a macabre lottery. On the other hand, as long as we deny the Raven, he is almost silent, but our blood keeps weak. Have you accepted this deal with the Raven? Oh, me? Not at all. It is the reason my powers are so faint. However, Mr. Oliver, there is more to me failing to find the answer you asked for than my lack of gift. I could clearly notice a deep shadow trying to obscure the answer. Someone powerful is working hard to keep this secret. I never felt something like that. So you are telling us that fortune telling will not help us? Yes, maybe. There is a possibility. My cousin is much more skilled with the gift of foresight than I. If you want, I could take you to her working place and maybe she would be able to help you. It is in an occult shop not far from here. What do you guys think about it? We came this far, right? Tom said to Daniel. Sure. Amanda Noir was cleaning the storefront's new window with a cloth. The shop was vandalized again? No need to worry, Obadiah. It has been a long time since the last one. Don't you want to stay somewhere else for a while? No one among the Ebony Dagger would deny you shelter. Nah, it is okay. I worked hard to build this place, and yay, I achieved it. I am not going to leave so easily. Anyway, I am happy you are visiting. What can I help you with? Well, there is this girl I'm seeing, Isabella, and I really like her. But you know she is not a Nosferatu. It feels wrong to keep lying to her and putting her in danger. Cochise thinks I should stay away for good or bring her into the blood. I know he is right, but I can't make up my mind to leave her. And how would one of us ever dream about getting authorization from the council? Maybe you could speak with Caroline. She is your sire, after all. Amanda said, finishing with the window. She moved to the store counter and started tidying it up. We haven't talked for quite some time. Our crew is not at the best standing with the council and you know we did not part on good terms. I'm not sure she would help. So many vampiric problems could be solved with a heart-to-heart, -heart, but Nosferatu love intrigue, don't they? The conversation was interrupted by the chime of the front door opening. James, Oliver, Tom and Daniel entered the occult shop. They immediately felt the scent of incense. Sweet, but not too overt. You got clients. I am not going to keep you busy. I'll be right outside in case the vandals try something again. Obadiah, there is no need for that. Everything is okay now. No worries. The strong man excused himself with a nod passing by towards the exit. When Amanda realized it was James coming in, a smile grew in her face, and they hugged. Amanda, these are Oliver, Tom, and Daniel. Oliver is Nicholas C. Graham's child, and he asked me for help. Tom and Daniel are his colleagues. Oh, that Nicholas, um? I'm sorry, but do you know my sire? I've heard about him. A lot. Well, how can I help? They asked me for a divination. I tried, but I could not answer their question. As you are the only other Morrigan at the King's Court, I brought them to you. Wait a second, you said the only other Morrigan. Are you saying there are only you two? James and Amanda's eyes met. House Morrigan has been punished with the royal censure. 
James and I are the last ones at the king's court. The others have been hunted and destroyed. Well, there is my mother. She is known as the child. But she is more of an independent force than a member of the court. More like a force of nature, unpredictable and merciless. Nosferatu never come close to her domains. We are all scared of what may come of it. You mean the child vampire in the outskirts of the city? I heard about it in my introduction, but I thought it was more like a... myth? <laughs> Amanda replied with a small nervous laugh. I am sorry. I did not want to be inconvenient. Are you two safe from the king's court now? We try to keep out of trouble and live our eternity in peace. But you never know. The council is always looking for a pretext. By God, an entire house hunted and destroyed? For sure anything sacred wants to keep away from Dreadford. They all stood in silence until Oliver broke it. He proceeded to tell Amanda the whole case. Ms. Noir, James told me you are a powerful diviner. I am willing to pay any price if you can answer my questions. I am sorry, Mr. Oliver, but I do not make divinations for Nosferatu. I want to keep out of politics and intrigues. The Council keeps asking me to see the future for them, but I always deny because I don't trust them. So, you see, if they get wind of me using my gift for any other Nosferatu could be the end of me. Is there anything we can do to change your mind? No, Mr. Oliver. There isn't. I am terribly sorry. Before any of the Midnight Fiends could reply, James interfered. Cousin, they seem to be good people. Are you sure there is no way you can help them? I tried my best, but to no avail. Our progenitor was known as a powerful fortune teller, but she was also a very capable advisor. If I cannot help you with the gift of foresight and you agree, I can try counseling you. Oliver felt crushed down. So close and yet somehow the truth always eluded him. Daniel put a hand on his friend's shoulder to try comforting him. Okay, I am game. So, no soothsaying. If you had advice for us that could help in this case, what would it be? Looking to the past is a great way to predict the future. It is not 100%, but is always a good start. The person who sent you the bag and the card is for sure attached to things that should be long dead and buried, however, are still walking. It is clear that this person cares a lot for and is trying to keep alive a very specific period. I would bet the card you received was made at the same place the originals were during the 19th century. And I think you have good odds of finding something at the place where the Sunrise Emporium had its first company headquarters. That is actually a very good hunch. Wait a minute, but this is more than a hundred years ago. How can we discover the place? The City Hall records. I know the place very well, we can give it a look. We should go there and take copies so we can look for the info we need somewhere discreet. Well guys, what are we waiting for? The three Midnight Fiends thanked the Morrigans, and Oliver insisted on leaving each one with a fat check before they went away. James stayed behind, and when they had already left, he said in confidence to Amanda, Thank you, cousin. But there is something else I wish to talk to you about. When I was trying to help them, I saw something terrible, death, and not just one. The next night, in the upper floors of the Fang, Steve Corse, the right hand of the Duke, was receiving a worrying report from a familiar from his security detail. Sir, the Midnight Fiends have visited the fortune teller. After that, they proceeded directly to the city hall and made copies of a large variety of documents. Did the Morrigan use her power to help them? Inconclusive, sir. Troublesome. Where are they taking the copies to? To the motel room the Strix is using as refuge during the day. Steve could not believe his luck. He owned said motel. What if they were taking the documents to somewhere out of reach? These newborns were so amateurish that he almost felt pity on them. He turned to another Nosferatu who was with him inside the office, a member of House Orlock. Randolph, you already failed in dealing with them once. Do not fail again. I have an appointment with Jean-Luc at the Chevalier. When I return, I expect this situation to be sorted out. You know what to do. 